All righty. It looks like we have everyone with us today. I want to introduce Willie Hendrickson. He's going to be presenting on the topic that we have for discussion today. And that is prilling melt spraying, spray congealing. Is there really a difference? Um, Avika uh, is the, um, sorry, Willie Hendrickson is the CEO and founder of the Avika Group, uh, which was founded in 1994 as a spin off from 3M. Um, as a particle processing company. The Avika Group comprises of five manufacturing sites and over 290 employee owners, as Avika is uh, an ESOP, an employee owned organization. Uh, Willie has, um, our speaker today is Willie Hendrickson. He worked at 3M as a technical manager for a particle processing plant in 3M's corporate research facility. Willie received his PhD from the University of Florida, and he is also the president of a consortium called IFPRI, which stands for International Fine Particles Research Institute, and hopefully he'll discuss that with us today. It's a very exciting um, way to bring together um, organizations and students and universities. He is also the adjunct professor at the University of Minnesota's Department of Food and Science. And with that, I will let Willie take off and talk about our topic today, which um, should be exciting. Thank you, Willie. All right, thank you, Nicole. And, and thank everybody for, for joining us today. I, I, I hope you enjoy the talk. As Nicole said, I'm gonna talk about prilling, melt spraying, spray congealing. Is there a difference? I'm gonna go on to talk about a primer on melt processing concept uses and unique applications. So let's get going with this and, and see where we can go. The outline is I'm going to give you just a very short overview of Avika. I'm going to talk about what is uh, melt processing and general melt processing methods, some size limitations, usage, matrix materials, safety considerations, and then I'll give you three very unique uh, applications of prilling or melt processing, micro sponge, core shell beads, and geez, what was my other one? I have a third one in here and I, and I don't see it on here. In any case, uh, the Avika Group itself, as Nicole said, was founded by me in 1994 as a spinoff from 3M. We currently consist of five separate companies or sites. Uh, three of the sites are food processing, which makes this talk very uh, appropriate for the IFT today. And as Nicole said, we're somewhere between 270 and 290 employees. So the, the real definition of what is prilling, melt spraying, and spray congealing is they're all the same process. There's just different names for them. Uh, these are melt processes that involve taking a material that is meltable, atomizing it, as you can see on the top two slides. Uh, this is uh, either using a, a, a two fluid atomization or a spinning disc atomization, and then freezing the droplets that are formed to make solid beads. And those solid beads, I've, I've given you an example down here of a number of solid beads that have different additives in them. In this particular case, they're pigments or dyes. And typically what people are using prilling for is this additive delivery. And we'll talk about some of those additives that you can deliver or just as a handling. Uh, you can imagine that a nice spherical bead is easier to handle than flakes or, or powders. And in fact, they, they can be very nice, nice to handle. From a process, the process is very, very, Simple, I'm showing it here. I'm, I'm basically showing you a schematic of a spray dryer that has been converted into a prilling chamber simply by using different materials, multiple materials as opposed to dissolved materials, and running the process at cold temperatures to freeze the droplets as opposed to hot temperatures to dry the product that you would do in a spray dryer. Now, the as I said, the, the process parameters are always melts in a prilling process. Uh, there can be some solutions, which I'll show you in just a, just a second, but they're not water solutions and they're, the solutions always are freezing, not, not drying. Typically, we're, we're looking at melts between 50 and 200 degrees, and you can get outside of that process range, but it, it, it gets hard to handle, uh, uh, typically. One of the real issues and limitations of, of a prilling process or a melt atomization process or a melt processing process is the viscosity needs to be below 300 centipoise. Now, I'll give you an example of a, of a 
melt process that has gone bad because of high viscosity. And that's the formation of cotton candy. If you've ever seen cotton candy be made, and I'm sure most of us have at a fair or a, a festival of some sort, basically what they're doing is they're putting, putting granular sugar onto a hot spinning disc that actually spins out and tries to atomize the sugar, but the melt viscosity of sugar is so high that you don't form beads, but instead you form fibers and you actually make cotton candy. As I said, lots of different atomizers that you can use. We'll be talking a little bit about a drip later on, but you know, spinning disc, two fluid, single fluid, ways to make droplets, uh, you know, all of them work very nicely and each of them have their advantages one way or the other. The chamber temperature, as I said, is gonna be low, typically 30 to 50 to 60 degrees centigrade below the melting point so we can cool that droplet and freeze it. Uh, depending on the size of your chamber, you can have throughputs that range anywhere from one to 5,000 kilograms an hour. Now the product parameters that you get out of, out of uh, melt processing, boy, the smallest, the smallest materials I've, I've seen made consistently and it was hard to do were 10 micron uh, beadlets out of, out of the system. But commercially, people go all the way up to five millimeters and even higher. I can tell you when you get to those big beads, the, the chambers get extremely large just because you need a lot of time to cool everything down and solidify the material. Now, these prills or, or melt, melt process beads are all a matrix particles, uh, which I mean that the, the active ingredient is dispersed throughout the entire beadlet. And typically with a matrix particle, you can get between five and 50% active ingredient loading in the, in, the, in the beadlet. I will show you an example where you can get all the way up to 90%, and that's a very special case. But you know, the idea is you know, if you keep within that five to 50%, you're in a, you're in a great spot for a, for a melt atomization process. Uh, some of the matrix materials and additives are shown that we can, that we can typically use in food processing for uh, melt atomization are shown here. Hydrogenated vegetable oils are a great matrix. Mono diglycerides, phytosterols, animal fats. Isomalt is a, is a sugar alcohol that unlike sugar itself has a low viscosity so you can actually melt and atomize isomalt. Gelatin is, a, is another material under certain conditions you can actually uh, uh, melt atomize. And finally there's PEG, uh, which, is, which is used in a number of different food applications. The additives are shown on the, on the uh, right side of the, the slide. Vitamins and minerals are uh, just a really typical one that, that people like to use. It's a great way of delivering these value added materials in a, in a way that can be easily used. Vegetable oils, which I'll talk about in just a, a bit on another slide. Hydrocolloids, water dyes, these are all you know, just examples of some of the additives that you can use. I will tell you that probiotics and temperature sensitive materials, because we're running at high temperatures, are typically not used in melt atomization processes. I, I'm sure that we could think of a way that we could do it, but typically not done. Before I leave this slide, I, I'd just like to talk a little bit about hydrocolloids. Um, you know, hydrocolloids, uh, you know, typically when you try to get them into water to increase your viscosity or water holding characteristics can be difficult to handle. We had one customer that came to us one time and said, you know, would it be possible to make a melt atomized material with uh, carboxymethylcellulose in it? And we thought about it a little bit and, and it turned out that we could actually do that. And what happened, it was a great method for putting a hydrocolloid into a wet matrix, not having it gel up right away until you heated it up and melted the fat. And you had just a wonderful way of dispersing that hydrocolloid without all the gel formation that goes on. So lots of interesting things that, that, that you can do. Now, let's just talk before we get to the, to, the, to the real specific examples that I wanna talk about, let's talk about some safety issues with melt processing. You have to be aware that this is a, an explosion hazard. There's been at least three explosions that I know of, and there's probably been many, many more, one in Ohio, one in Iowa, one in Kansas, these are all in the last 10 years. In the Iowa and Kansas uh, explosions, the prilling explosions, there was building damage, uh, but there was no one that was killed. In the case of the Ohio uh, explosion, three people were killed in a, in a situation like that. 
So even though I, I, I point out that you can easily convert one of your spray dryers to a prilling process, please be aware that you shouldn't do this unless you have some sort of suppression on the system or some sort of inerting on the system to keep uh, explosions from happening. Uh, we actually use inerting in, in, our, in our production facility uh, and that works out very, very nicely, but other people use suppression and whatever you use, uh, you know, think about safety before you, you jump into this process. Now let's start out and talk about micro sponge prills. And, and this, is a, this is a really interesting uh, question that we were asked again and again and again, and we never had the right answer. And the question was, what's the maximum amount of oil that can be added to a, a prill, a, a, a melt bead? And you know, my thought always is, you know, I'm adding an oil to another oil, and let's just use hydrogenated vegetable oil, and I'm adding vegetable oil to it. How much can I add? 10%, 20%? Uh, after I was asked this question about the fourth time, I said, you know, let's just go in the lab and find out what the limits are. And it turned out it wasn't 20 or 30%, it was, it was 90%. And this was very interesting because this was, you know, some of the the the, the Things that happen that you don't expect, and so I, I'll give you, I'll give you kind of the scenario. If I take vegetable oil, and I put a chunk of solid fat in there, a hydrogenated vegetable oil, and I put it into that the oil, that that solid is going to either sink or float, but it's not going to do anything. It's not going to dissolve until I heat it up. The fat melts, it dissolves into the oil, and from that point, when I cool it down. When the fat re-solidifies, it forms a micro sponge, as you can see down in the bottom on this SCM picture. Basically, what you have is a bicontinuous phase system with your liquid vegetable oil uh, encapsulated and, and imbibed into this micro sponge matrix. And you can have 10% hard fat and 90% oil, and you can still have a stable bead. I will tell you at that 90-10 uh, situation, it's very soft. It's an incredible mouthfeel, incredible hand feel. You might have to add maybe 20% fat to get a little bit more stable bead, but it's a great material to, to come up with a unique way of delivery systems. This is uh, this oil fat mixture when it's heated and, and cooled down is called an organogel. And we filed a patent on this many years ago that I think it's still active, active patent actually. So here's a, here's a, second, a, a second process that, that is different from a prilling standpoint. We had a customer come and ask us to make large four millimeter beads and we didn't have a system that could actually do that because it would have to be a very tall tower. And so we either had to say no to this process or we had to think about a different way of doing it. Not only did they want to make large beads, but they also wanted to make them exactly the same size. And so what we did, rather than build a 90-foot tower, we actually decided to do underwater prilling, underwater melt atomization. So what we did is we had an atomizer down at the bottom of our, of our, our chamber. We atomized into a hot water zone that as the beads rose, because they're lighter than water, they'd eventually get to a cold water zone solidify and then we could collect them. So this is kind of the, the, the concept that we did. So instead of having a 90 foot tower, we could have a foot and a half tower and we could, we could make some incredibly tight distribution beads, which I'll show you in just the next couple slides here. So here's a, here's a picture of the, of the apparatus that we put together. This was our, our first shot at it. We, we actually commercialized this. We made, we made commercial beads that were that four millimeter. And, let me just show you a, a video of what's what's going to happen here. So they, they've started. You heard you you might have heard John tell you that it that it started, and they're atomizing down in this hot water zone down at the bottom. The beads, the liquid beads, are rising and freezing. We'll get a little bit closer here in just a second. You can you can see that the atomizer down there and, and releasing those droplets. They get frozen by the time they get to the top, and then the beads are coming off the, off the top. This was an incredibly successful project to make this tight, tight distribution. I'll show you on this, on this next slide, and you can see these beads were 
you know, the same size, you know, nice and spherical, exactly what we were looking for, except it had one really interesting characteristic. And if you look over on the right side of the screen, you'll see a number of beads that we just cut in half. And so you're seeing the, the, the two halves here. And on the last two beads, you notice that there's a very small hole in each one. And the interesting part is we kind of knew this, but not completely, not completely, uh, you know, fully understood is that prilling processes has a has a, a an option or a, or a propensity of actually encapsulating some of the outside uh, media that you're in. So if it's air, you can have an air droplet in there, or in this case, it was a water droplet. So the beads were exactly the right size, but there was some differences in weight that you know we had to we had to figure out a way to get to get beyond this but a very interesting way of making big beads without lots of capital equipment so let's look at our last uh, example of unique processing we call this coaxial extrusion uh, when i was at 3m they had developed this process internally 3m called it the bitum process and basically what it is is atomizing of two liquids at the same time one on the outside and one on the inside. And so what you're actually making are, are droplets of a liquid inside a solid shell, as, as shown here. And let me just show you a picture of what a process looks like. You can see we have a, in this case, we're dripping into water because we're trying to freeze these beads. And you can see the, the close-up picture of the dripping process where the black center and the, the, the non-colored outside forms this nice black and white bead here. Shows you know, a really, really interesting way of, of making a, a bead that has a high loading of, of active and an active ingredient. So let me just, let me, let me click off here just for a second and we'll pull up a couple more videos to show you what's, uh, what's going on. Just one second. So you can see that the beads dripping down and forming that nice spherical uh, bead with the black center in here. Uh, you can do this with with smaller beads. This just was a was a good one for us to do because we can actually see it and and get an idea what uh, what's going on here. Kind of run this again to, to show it for you. Show you another example because I have some other things to, to talk about about you know some of the interesting things that happen here with this process. So here, what we're doing is I'll stop this for a second. This is a process that we were making uh, beads that had an outside shell with a blood substitute inside. So this was not a food process. This was a process to make a bead for a uh, process to make a bead for an application to be used in dummies for practicing tracheotomies. And the customer was looking for a way of making the tracheotomy cut look very realistic, i.e. it bled when you cut into it. And so what we're doing here is we're dripping the beads into the, into the system. This is the core shell bead. I just wanna stop again because what, what I want to point out here is this droplet of the, the fake blood and one over here, and there's another couple of them around in here that actually formed in this process. And this is just kind of that, that caveat in, in this process is that not all of your active ingredient will always stay in the middle. I think if we'd worked on this more, we could have actually, you know, tightened that down and had, you know, a better retention of the material. But you know, there's typically, you know, a half percent to a percent that might be on the outside of your bead. Well, let's just continue here and we'll show you something else. Just seeing that the beads dripping. So this is a drip atomization process. And let's just stop it right here. So once again, we can see the, the the fake blood up at the top. We can see this nice collection of beads down here. But also, please notice, even though that I'm getting a very tight distribution, very uniform droplets, there will always be, this is just the physics of atomization, there will always be small droplets that, that form also. We'll let the, the rest of this go on through here. 
and just uh, maybe maybe we can't see it this way but look at how you can see the beads that have the center of the the blood substitute in the in the inside nicely centered in the bead all right we'll get back to our show here all right a couple more slides this is just an example of some of the, the core shell beads that we made. You can see they can be dried out and taken out of, out of water and they're nicely stable. Here's some of them still in water and you can see that, that blood substitute center in there a little bit better when you're looking, looking through the beads. So prilling, you know, it's a very interesting process. It has the, has the, the opportunity to look at a broad range of materials, additives, and processing methods. You can make small beads, you can make large beads, you can make sponges, you can make core shell beads. Uh, it's got a lot of uses and uh, advantageous uh, characters. And please, if you, if you find this interesting, I'd love to hear from you. So please email us or call us for specific applications. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Willie. That was wonderful. We appreciate the overview of uh, what Avika can do as far as melt processing goes. So we thank you very much for your willingness to present on this topic today. Um, we, we do have some questions, so we'll go into in those in, in just a minute, but I wanted to also thank everyone who joined us for this webinar today. Um, and if you do have any questions, like Willie mentioned, he does have his contact information on this screen. So uh, please do reach out to us and we'd be happy to help you with what you need. Um, with that, I will then uh, transfer into uh, what questions we have. Thank you.